once again to Focus on Art. I'm your host, Barbara Cohenauer, and delighted you're with us again this evening. We're at the Five Tribes Museum in Muskogee, and my guest is Merv Jacobs. Merv, welcome to Focus on Art. Thank you. I'd like to just begin by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about who they are, where they live, and so forth. Well, I uh, live in Tahlequah, and I'm raising four kids over there. I, I moved there just, I moved down here to Oklahoma a few years ago from Kansas because this is where the good artists are. Well, those of us that live in Oklahoma certainly agree with that. Now, you are at Cherokee. Yes. And uh, represented here at the museum uh, are the works that are your most recent works. Yeah, everything in that, that we're going to be looking at today has been done in probably the last year and a half. Well, Merv, you were telling me earlier that a number of well-known artists have crossed your path, uh, artists that served as mentors for you. Let's talk about those artists for a minute. Um, when I was about 20 years old, I had the great good fortune to meet Thomas Hart Benton. He was retired. He was living in Kansas City. He had been kind of relegated upstairs to art history, but he was still, he was, you know, he was brilliant. But his, his style of art had become out of style with the mainstream, and so he was, he was a little bit embittered, I think. He thought maybe he deserved a little better treatment than he's getting the treatment that he deserves now, now that he's passed away. They're having big shows of his work all over the country and stuff. But he used to, we used to go see him at his studio, and uh, we would usually take him a bottle of Irish whiskey because if he was drinking Irish whiskey, he would tell you anything about <laughs> art and okay. stay up all night talking about art. Well, what a wonderful person to rub against your career as a very young man. Now, you have had some other artists that you have uh, dealt with or exchanged ideas with, too. Well, yeah, there's one person in particular, and he lives in Tahlequah. That's one of the reasons I live in Tahlequah. His name is Cecil Dick, mm -hmm. and he's kind of the father of Cherokee painting. He's about 72 years old now, and he's semi-retired. He's had health problems, but he's making a comeback. And uh, he knows, you know, he knows the art, the Indian art scene from its very beginnings. And he uh, knows Cherokee culture, and he knows Cherokee history, and he's very specific, and he's very meticulous about everything that he paints. And I think that's real important. There's a lot of what you'd have to call, you know, generic pan-Indian pseudo-mysticism being passed off as art these days. And to me, it's a lot more important to, to portray the specific things, you know, and, and the, the study of the plants and animals and the, the environment itself is as important as the people because they were inseparable. Those people lived in a very simple, you know, agrarian hunting, uh, gathering culture and, and uh, they walked everywhere they went or they rode in a canoe. The, the, the uh, rivers were their highways and the forest was their supermarket, everything that they needed, whether it was clothing or, or food or tools, came right out of the woods. They didn't, you know, they had a trade network but that was mostly for ornamental stuff. The things they really needed, they, they always settled right by a river up high enough to keep their feet dry if the river flooded and uh, the animals would be coming down to the river to get a drink. Mm -hmm. So they were in a good spot to be hunters and uh, of course the best garden lands always along the rivers too. Here at Muskogee was probably the heart of uh, Indian culture in Oklahoma a thousand years ago. Great, there was a great city here where the three rivers came together. There was a big uh, ball play field that was paved, the only one this side of Mexico. People from Oklahoma don't realize what a cultural center this was then. And the rivers, being the highways, made mm -hmm. Muskogee the cultural center. And uh, the best carving and, and the best artwork and stuff I've seen out of Oklahoma came from right here. Merv, I know you bring all of this information about Indian history, uh, information about the locale in which the Indians were living and working, to your paintings. So let's take a look at some of those paintings and see how all of this comes together in these beautiful visual images. 
Where do you want to start here? Which well, why don't we just good? start? Let's start with the first one when you come up the stairs over there. Okay, well, that, that painting is called uh, A Cherokee Hunter at the Village of the Little People. Now, all the Cherokees will tell you stories about the little people who live in the woods. And invariably, they're more primitive. They've kept the old ways. If you look at the little people in that painting, they're doing a dance, and you can see that the men are all dressed in the, the skins of raccoons, and they have their faces painted like raccoons. And the women are all wearing feather, feather over buckskin dresses, you know, the kind that the old Cherokee people probably wore 500, 1,000 years ago. And the hunter, he's from the time of uh, oh, pre-revolutionary war you know, back in the east. And he's come upon this village of the little people at night, and he's there observing one of their dances. He knows enough about the little people not to uh, accept any food that they offer him or drink that they offer him because they live in a slightly different dimension. And if he was to partake of their um, offering to him, then he would, well, the way Cecil Dick described it, a, a night at the village of the little people is equal to 10 years in the, in the human world. I think it's kind of that the, the Rip Van Winkle story came from the Cherokee stories of the little people. Or the, you know, the Iroquois had the same stories. And uh, so he's there, but he's cautious because he knows that they have great, even though they don't mean him any harm, they have great powers that can harm him, so he's very careful not to harm them or, or you know, do anything to, he's just there, and, and soon he will leave because he knows it's not st safe to stay there for a long time. And when we were looking around the museum earlier, we were looking at a book jacket that's uh, on a book that comes from a, from a Cherokee story about Mr. Rabbit. Why don't you tell us about, a little bit about that? Well, Rabbit was one of the main characters in the Cherokee animal stories. The Uncle Remus stories were taken from the Cherokee animal stories. If you look at the animals involved, they're not African animals, they're all native southeastern animals, you know, and the stories are old Cherokee stories. In this particular, and Rabbit is kind of, uh, he's a trickster, he's, a, he's malicious, he's, he's very clever, he's got a good sense of humor, but he's always trying to trick somebody out of something, but it always backfires kind of like a sitcom. And in this, uh, in this story, Rabbit is going to the council of all the animals and he runs into his friend Otter. Well, well, Rabbit's been, had his eye on Otter's coat for a long time and he wants Otter's coat. So he starts formulating a plan as soon as they meet that he can trick Otter out of his coat. And it gets to be evening and they're looking for a place to camp and they come to a pretty spot along the river, and Rabbit said, says, well, this is a good spot to camp, but this is the place that they call the place where the fire falls from the sky. So if, you, if we camp here, if the fire falls from the sky, the safest thing to do is to jump into the water, and then you can, uh, you'll be safe. In the middle of the night, Rabbit gets up, and he stirs up the coals in the fire, and he scoops up a takes a piece of bark and he scoops up a big handful of coals and he throws them into the air and at the same time he goes, yay! And the otter wakes up and sees the fire falling from the sky and he dives into the water. Well, he's left his coat hanging there on the tree. So Rabbit just puts his coat on and goes on to the dance that the animals are having. And when he gets there, the dance is already in progress, so he just kind of slips out onto the dance ground and starts dancing among them wearing Otter's coat. Well, Bear recognizes him. Rabbit's dancing with his paw over his nose because his nose was split in a, in a, when he had this incident with Flint. He tried to kill Flint, but he didn't kill him. He just blew Flint all over the place. And when he did that, it split his nose. And um, so Bear walks over there and brushes Rabbit's paw aside and he says, aha, Rabbit. And Rabbit immediately bolts to go running off. Well, at this point, Rabbit still had his tail, his long, luxurious tail that he was so famous for. But Bear reaches out and grabs him by the tail and holds on, and Rabbit 
jerk so hard trying to get away that he pulls his own tail off and goes running off into the, throws the coat down and goes running off into the bushes. And that's how Rabbit lost his tail. Wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that with us, Mark. Now tell us about the, about the artwork. It's going to be a book jacket, is that right? Well, there's a girl named Gail Ross, and she lives in uh, Fredericksburg, Texas. She's coming up for the Cherokee holidays tomorrow. She'll be here. And she tells the stories real well. In fact, she told me that story over the phone. And I uh, just happened to remember it, because it's a good story. And I did a painting of Rabbit and Otter, and we sent it to, uh, for Parabola. And they make tapes, you know, children's tapes. And uh, Harper and Rowe saw the, heard the tape and saw the painting that I did. And they want us to do a ch series of children's books which we're going to start on this winter. I think the first one has to be done in the spring. So we'll try to get it done. And you know, by Christmas, I'll have the first book done. But we want to do, there aren't that many people doing good children's books. You know, and it doesn't pay that well. But I don't think, I don't think that's the point. I think the most important thing is to be able to you know, preserve some of that Cherokee culture. So we're going to do a series of books. And maybe they'll catch on. You know, maybe they will be good. Well, Merv, tell us about the series of paintings uh, that are over your right shoulder. Okay, uh, Robert Conley, he's a, he's a Cherokee writer. He lives in Tahlequah. He's the author of The Witch of Going Snake. He's written a lot of stuff. In fact, he's writing a series of books for Doubleday right now. But this particular book, Robert wanted to write something on the Trail of Tears. It's a theme that's really been hackneyed. A lot of bad stuff's been put out. But, but he brought this manuscript and showed it to me. And uh, I read it and asked him if he would care if I did some illustrations for it. And he said, go ahead. And uh, the illustrations just kind of go along with the story. OU, we're still negotiating with OU Press. They, they haven't quite, we're, we've jumped about all the hurdles, but you know, college presses move slow. And uh, they've never published a book of original fiction with color illustrations. So if they do, it'll be a big first. I've got some people pulling for it at the press to get published, but we'll still have to wait and see. But anyway, the story, the old man is telling the story to his grandson, and the story um, is about a couple who, they came together and met in the period right before the Trail of Tears, and then were separated. He was captured by the soldiers and marched to Oklahoma. She managed to hide out in the mountains. She kept thinking he was alive and trying to find him, and finally she found a man who would go and look for him. And he came and found him here in Oklahoma and brought him back. But the story covers the Trail of Tears in a, in a it's not a bitter, and it's not done in a bitter way. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's told more historically and matter-of-factly. He uses a lot of historical documents from the time thrown in with the story so you can see what the president was thinking, what Daniel Webster was thinking, what you know, the different, you know, and then he uses some documents later in the book that were written by historians of the Cherokees. And running all through this is the thread of, of the story and the thread of the narration of the story. It's, you know, it's a multi-level book and it, it probably takes a harder look at the Trail of Tears than has ever been taken before. A lot of, it kind of ties, ties the Trail of Tears to the turbulence of the whole time. You know, it was the time when the, when the, uh, Europeans really wanted to expand westward, you know, and, and they felt like the, the Indian people were blocking their path, so they were doing anything they could do to get them out of the way. And, and it's a love story. They're, that's the neatest thing about it is that it's a love story, you know, and it's a little like uh, Evangeline was to the, you know, the poem Evangeline that Longfellow wrote. It's, it's kind of that same story. We might go from here to looking at some of the paintings uh, where the wildlife is actually a very interesting and integral <coughs> part of that. Uh, we were looking at a couple of paintings earlier where the animals are actually extinct. Uh, maybe we should go and take a look at those and let you comment about those a little bit. Okay, um, this, this painting is a, a painting of a Cherokee, old time Cherokee village in the fall. And there's, there are these brightly colored birds flying across the foreground. Those are Carolina, <coughs> those are Carolina parakeets. 
the last one died in the Cincinnati Museum in 1909, but they were a native parrot. They were native to the southeast, and I think they were as far west as Oklahoma. They were seed-eating birds, and uh, the farmers literally hunted them to extinction. The birds, instead of flying off when one of their flock was killed, they would fly back and they would circle around the dead one and then it, they would cry, you know, and so farmers were able to kill off whole flocks of the birds, which I understand were also good to eat. So from millions of these birds in the 1700s when Ottoman painted them, early 1800s, by 1909 they were completely gone. I've seen these birds represented in uh, carved shell designs and stuff from the old mounds, usually misrepresented in, in the text as being hawks because People now don't even realize what the birds were. Yeah, well, they're gorgeous birds, and the fact that they're extinct, extinct is one of the real uh, problems I think we have at this, in this country. Now, you've been trying to address that problem kind of on a, as a one person and an individual basis. I think everybody needs to, um, you know, literally fight to protect the environment. I, I really think it's important. Um, the forces that be in this state will let you do just about anything with a $25 permit. And, uh, and it, I did a painting for NACE. It's a, it's a painting of 16 different uh, birds and animals which are listed as federally endangered in Oklahoma. I think the federal government should have done this, but NACE were the ones who did it, the Native Americans for a Clean Environment. They, they're a, they're a small environmental organization out of Tahlequah, but they're, they're giant killers. You know, they're going after the people who are the worst. And they're willing to, I, you know, considering what's happened to some of the people who have stood up to these organizations, to these corporations, they're brave, you know. And so I did the painting for them to kind of, to show these birds and animals. Now the uh, proceeds from this poster actually go to help the Native American effort for the clean environment. Yeah, the, the people in Tahlequah, Native Americans for a Clean Environment, have the posters and they have them for sale there. They can call them up and have them send them one. Uh, you do have some paintings that go uh, into Cherokee history, uh, very early Cherokee history along the Tennessee River. Maybe that would be a good point to go to next. Well, yeah, the, the Tennessee River was kind of the, the, the main highway of the old Cherokee Nation, and the villages were just kind of strung like pearls along the Tennessee River. And a lot of the paintings that I do that have water scenes, I've kind of related back to the Tennessee River, but I've even had to reconstruct that because they came through with the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority in the 1930s, and they flooded almost all the old villages under reservoirs. And so, most of the scenes you're looking at now would be under 50 feet of water or 20 feet of water. And, uh, but, but at one time, the Tennessee River was kind of the heart, kind of the lifeline of the Cherokee Nation, you know. And it starts up in the, in the Smoky Mountains in Virginia, runs down through North Carolina, through Tennessee, down through Alabama, and then back up through Tennessee where, where it runs into the uh, Mississippi River. It makes a great big loop around Tennessee there. And uh, that's where the, you know, that's where the Cherokee villages were. Well, these are certainly lovely paintings. Uh, one features the azaleas that are uh, indigenous to that part of the country. Well, yeah, the Smoky Mountains. It all comes back to the Smoky Mountains. And I would encourage anyone who has never been to see the Smoky Mountains to go see them. Go see them tomorrow if you can. You won't regret it. But there are 50 species of azaleas in North America, and 49 of them, <coughs> excuse me, 49 of the species of azaleas are native to the Smoky Mountains, all the way from Pennsylvania down to Georgia. And the, around here, the azaleas bloom for a few weeks and they're gone. But up there in that forest, they're great big, huge trees, and they bloom all summer. And all summer long, the azaleas are. They call them rhododendrons up there, and all summer long they're covered with hummingbirds and butterflies and moths, and each tree is just covered with big bouquets of, of flowers varying from white to orange to pink to red, you know, and, and some of them are quite fragrant. A couple of paintings are right up in the front corner, and one of those I thought was extremely interesting. You were telling me the story of a Cherokee 
We could say outlaw, but it seems as if history's not proving that to be uh, true. Ned Christie. Well, he was certainly an outlaw, but whether he was a criminal or not was never decided. He was accused of murder. He was a, he was a gunsmith. He was a blacksmith. He was on the executive council of the Cherokee Nation, and he was um, accused of a murder that he uh, always denied that he, admit, that he committed. And rather than run and change his name like a lot of people would have done, Ned Christie went home and built a fort. And the judge over, it, this fell under the jurisdiction of Isaac Parker, the hanging judge. Mm -hmm. And Parker sent out waves of deputies every so often to try to bring Ned Christie to justice, you know, his, his term, justice, you know. And uh, uh, finally, after about five years, they went there with a troop of cavalry and they brought a cannon and they tried to blow down the fort, but it was made out of double-walled log, oak logs with sand in between them, and they couldn't even hurt it with a cannon shooting a five-inch ball. And so they waited till night, and they snuck in and dynamited the place. And uh, when Christie fled from the f ensuing fire, he was shot in the back and killed. Um, a lot of people have come under the opinion that Ned Christie was killed because he was opposed to the Dawes Commission. He said, uh, you know, as long as he lived, the Dawes Commission would never divide up the Cherokee Nation it w into allotments that would be kept as one solid piece of land. Well, we can see where allotment has brought us now. The Cherokee allotments are just a few little scattered places back in the woods, and, and the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma really no longer exists except as a political body. And uh, Christie, you know, he, he was written up in the dime novels of his time as one of the bloodthirstiest outlaws of the West, but the facts just don't bear it out. In fact, the only thing he was ever charged with besides that murder that they're pretty sure he didn't commit was resisting arrest, and he did resist arrest. He was probably the last real Cherokee patriot, but uh, that's not to say he is the last Cherokee patriot that there will ever be. Well, Merv, I know you also are a pipe maker, and I'd like to take a moment and look at those pipes. But before we do that, are there any paintings that we have failed to mention that you'd like to bring into this interview? Well, I'd just like to maybe show a couple of minutes of the paintings that I, that I, where I do the old designs out of the mounds. I, uh, the, a lot of the sh designs that I used are from old shell carvings. And these paintings, I just, they're probably the most authentic because they just go back to the basic designs off the shell carvings that the people themselves did and translate them on up into kind of modern art. You know, there's such a wealth of information and imagery in the Southeast. You know, the Southeast really bore the brunt of the European invasion. And uh, to mix a metaphor, the Southeastern culture was kind of bulldozed under the carpet. But you know, day by day we're finding out new stuff about that culture and, and every once in a while someone opens up a mound and we're able to look back into the things from that. And that stuff fascinates me. In, in Oklahoma here there's a place called Spyro Mound and a lot of the imagery that I use comes from Spyro. And there were several real good shell carvers living at Spyro and they literally carved the whole society onto these shell drinking vessels, and you can take these and study them and look at them and see who the Spyro Mound people were. And uh, I like to, I like to uh, do the old designs as, as uh, kind of modern paintings. Well, these are really lovely, and I appreciate your sharing them with us. Now let's take a look at your pipe business. Well, uh, I've always liked pipes. You know, even when I was a little kid, I think I was fascinated by Somebody would have a carved pipe or something like that, and uh, the Cherokees were the pipe makers of the southeast. That uh, black pipe stone comes from up in the Cherokee land, but a lot of their pipes, most of their pipes were made out of ceramic. They were made out of clay that was fired in a fire, and then the stems were made out of river cane. So I make the pipes like the old pipes. I've quit using clay dug out of a creek bank because so many of them break. You just can't fire them hot enough to make them strong. These, they call these effigy pipes, and, and they're bird and animal and human designs, you know, and, and they found a lot of these in the old Cherokee mounds. That these people really loved their pipes. The, uh, the, pipes were sac the pipe was sacred. 
to the old time people. The, the fire was sacred and the tobacco was sacred and the pipe was the coming together of the two sacred things, you know. The smoke was sacred. The smoke from the tobacco would carry your prayers up to heaven. In fact, a long time ago, um, I was admonished about being real careful about making smoking just a habit. That when I do smoke, it should be thought of as a prayer and it should be done with with respect, you know. And uh, I've tried to do that. I mean, I'm not going to sit around in some nasty old bar smoking cigarettes, you know. I just won't do it. Okay, as we look at these pipes, uh, the images that are carved on them, they must be sacred too. And uh, they are traditional images? Well, a lot of the pipe designs that I make are real old, you know. And some of them I make are brand new that I've just Every once in a while, an idea for a pipe design will come to me. And, but, but yeah, I like to do birds. I like to do the animals. I like to do sometimes humans. I don't make very many human pipes. I mostly like to make bears and, and uh, squirrels and frogs and woodpeckers and eagles. And OK, well, Merv, I really appreciate your being <laughs> with us here for Focus on Art, all of the Cherokee history, that you've shared with us today, your views on the environment. Uh, besides being a wonderful artist, I think you're making a, a marvelous contribution uh, to life and the quality of life here in Oklahoma. And I, as well as your neighbors here in this part of the state, appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. For those of you at home, we appreciate your being with us, as always, for Focus on Art. We'll look forward to seeing you next time, and until then, this is Barbara Cohen-Air wishing you a most pleasant good evening.